Welcome everyone. Uh, we're so glad that you could join us today for the Clinical Trials 101 Roundtable. Um, I'll start off by introducing myself. My name is Sarah Turnus and I'm currently a Master of Public Health student in Epidemiology at the University of Iowa College of Public Health. And I have had the pleasure of working with the Iowa Cancer Consortium this semester uh, to develop a Clinical Trials 101 Roundtable, uh, which is why we're all here today. So uh, in the interest of time, I'll turn it over to Kelly to briefly introduce herself and the Iowa Cancer Consortium. Thanks, Sarah. And um, I hope you'll all join, join me in, in giving Sarah an extra big thanks because she's been working really hard on this for a semester uh, to put this really great informational session together. So Sarah, thank you for everything. And it has been a total pleasure to work and with my you. My pleasure. So thank you. Uh, my name is Kelly wells Siddig. my pronouns are she, her, and I am really excited to be with all of you today. I want to tell you very briefly about the Iowa Cancer Consortium for those who might be new. I think all of us here know that cancer is a complex and costly disease, and re reducing the burden of cancer here in our state and the burden that cancer puts on the people of our state is not something that can be done by a single person or even a single organization. And that's why the Iowa Cancer Consortium exists. The uh, consortium is a coalition of nearly 500 individuals, many of you who are, are on today's session as well, uh, individuals and organizations who recognize the importance of working together. Collaboration is key. It's really at the heart of what we do, working together to reduce the burden of cancer in our state. So thank you for being here. And I'm actually uh, really quickly, if you're all willing to um, introduce yourselves before we move on or while we move on in the chat, that would be really great. And let us know where you're coming from and what brought you here today. And Sarah, back to you. Great. Excellent. So as Kelly mentioned, you know, the purpose of why we're here today is to facilitate a discussion around the basics of clinical trials and then provide an opportunity for all of you as participants to ask questions and really just have a dialogue with some of Iowa's most experienced ex experts on this topic uh, who are with us on the call. So we would like to stress that while we hope to provide you with some salient advice and information today, this is meant to be an educational discussion only and therefore not uh, a substitute for medical advice. So we urge you to not use this meeting as a replacement for talking to your doctor and planning a competent care plan with them. However, we hope that we can give you some tools in order to uh, help you the next time you do see your doctor. So with that formality out of the way, then I want to quickly move on to Zoom. So for some of us, we've been living on Zoom for the past couple of years, and for others of us, this is very new. Uh, so I just want to make you aware that in the lower left-hand side of your screen, that's where the unmute and the video are. And so we uh, urge you to turn on your video if you can, just to make this discussion more interactive. And then if at any point in time you do have a question and would like to ask it verbally, then you can just go ahead and unmute yourself um, and ask your question. And then on the bottom, kind of the middle part of your screen is where the chat feature is. And that's where Kelly was saying you can type in either your name or a question that you might have. And that's another way to interact during the meeting. So uh, with no further ado, we'll uh, move on to Shannon Benson, and she is the um, director of the Iowa Oncology Research Association, and she's going to lead us off with a presentation. So while I am pulling up her slides, I will let Shannon uh, introduce herself. Hello, everybody. Uh, I am Shannon Benson, Executive Director of the Iowa Oncology Research Association. And I have the privilege of giving you a very basic um, slide deck. Um, if you, it, there's a lot of backgrounds on the call. So um, if you work in clinical trials a lot, then I hope this just reinforces the, how important the work that you do is. Um, if you are a patient, you might learn something new. If you're brand new to clinical trials, then this is definitely the thousand foot view uh, for you. Uh, next slide, please, Sarah. Sorry about that. Okay. That's okay. So a brief introduction to who I work for. Um, we were 
Iowa Oncology Research Association is a small nonprofit, but we've actually been in business since 1978. And, you know, our purpose is just to offer Iowans um, the opportunity to participate in over 100 national and international clinical trials. We are federally funded by the National Cancer Institute, and we actually have offices in Des Moines and Cedar Rapids and Ames. And we're made up of a group of investigators. So we have medical oncologists, we have radiation and surgical oncologists. We also have supporting investigators. So um, urologists, pathologists, um, radiology members. So we have a, a broad group of investigators that make up our team. Next slide. So I, I'd love to hear from everybody. Um, you can drop something in the chat, but this, you know, I've given this presentation before and a lot of times it's with patient groups at support groups, but I like to hear, you know, from them, what do you think of when you hear a clinical trial? So if something jumps out at you, um, drop it in the chat and, you know, we can look at that later. Something that I often hear is guinea pig. Um, other times someone will say placebo, things like that. I definitely will touch on the placebo aspect of it later. Um, but if anything else jumps out at you, drop it in the, in the chat. I also like to ask if um, anybody ever participated in a clinical trial. It doesn't have to be oncology-based. Um, you know, I even hear ads sometimes on the radio, you know, for a diabetic trial or, um, you know, lots of hair loss. Who knows? It could be anything that you'll hear about participating in a clinical trial. And then I always like to ask um, how many were offered participation if they are a patient themselves in a clinical trial or if they knew the opportunity existed in Des Moines. Next slide. So what is a clinical trial? Um, you know, the true definition is just that it's a research study that involves people. So scientific discoveries are providing insight into the causes and new ways to prevent, detect, diagnose, and treat cancer. And people who participate in cancer clinical trials have an opportunity to contribute to the scientist's knowledge about cancer and to help in the development of improved cancer treatments. Next slide. Clinical trials are important. I think we all know that. Um, you know, cancer probably, I don't think I can, that there's anybody out there who wouldn't say cancer has impacted them or affected them. Um, if, it's a, if it's themselves, if it's a loved one, it could be a neighbor, somebody from church, everybody knows somebody with cancer. And so clinical trials are really a critical part of the research process. Um, I've had people say they just, you know, are uncomfortable with clinical trials or, um, you know, even physicians who just say, you know, I just, clinical trials are too much work, but, um, you know, every treatment that they offer their patient, every effective treatment out there is based on data from a previous clinical trial. So we all, I, we can't stress enough how important that they are. Next slide, please. Participation is obviously important. The more people who participate, the faster that these critical questions are answered, leading to better treatment and prevention options for all cancer. I think in the past, clinical trials were kind of seen as a last resort for patients with no other treatment options. And that sometimes is still the case. I'll touch on this a little bit later. Um, but we definitely have, we have a lot of studies for early stage diseases. Um, no, no treatment, no, no cure rate is ever good enough. We're always going to be looking for something better, or we're looking for something that is, has the cure rate that is equivalent, but less side effects. So we're always going to be continuing to look for something better. Next slide. I always like to point out the difference in children and adult participation. So we've had a ton of improvements, um, over the last 30, 40 years in, um, children with cancer and their clinical outcomes. And that is because more than 60% of children with cancer in the United States participate in a clinical trial where the national average for adults is only 5%. Next slide. Here's a survey, and I know this is old data, but I, I left it on here just because I think this is still important. So a survey in 2000 found that most people with cancer were unaware participation in a clinical trial was an option for their treatment, and most said they would have been willing to enroll if they would have known. So something we're trying to fix around here. Next slide. So why are people not participating? Um, I think, I think number one is a lack of awareness, what I just talked about. They didn't know it was an option for them. Um, 
another another part is lack of access. Um, you know, not every place offers clinical trials. Not every cancer center offers clinical trials. I think there's also some fear, distrust, or suspicions of research. Um, you know, they are not able to most with most clinical trials. You're not able to choose your treatment. There's a true randomization process. Um, and that's scary for some people. They, they don't like that guinea pig feeling. Um, they're afraid of receiving no treatment. Once again, I'll, talk, I'll touch on that with that placebo piece in a couple of slides. There can be some personal obstacles, so they may have to leave their physician. So in order to enroll on one of our trials, you have to enroll through one of our investigators, our rostered investigators. So if you... Um, if, you're, if your doctor is not a member of our organization, you would have to transfer care to someone who is, and that sometimes people don't wanna do that. Next slide. There's insurance worries. Um, you might be worried that there could be in additional testing, um, that the clinical trials, that the trial requires, uh, they might worry that if a drug is investigational, that it would not be covered. So I really, you know, one important thing that our staff does with patients is kind of talk through that, um, you know, if you're going on, on a clinical trial and there is an investigational agent, it is more than likely covered by the trial. It is paid for by the trial. If there is something outside of your routine care, it should be paid for by the trial. And so that's something that, you know, when we're opening a trial that we ensure for the patient, um, because that's important. Uh, you might think of additional barriers. Again, I'd love for you to drop those in the, in the chat and we can take a look at those if there's time. Next slide. So it's a long process, the clinical trial process. And um, you know, really what we do is kind of a final step in a long process that does truly begin with lab and animal testing. And again, the intent is to try and find better ways to prevent, detect, or treat diseases or to improve care for people with diseases. Next slide. There are tons of types um, of, of clinical trials, and I'm just gonna touch on a few that we do um, here locally, because I kind of feel like that's what I know the most about. And then I'll talk about what the different phases of trials are. So prevention trials, uh, we have definitely had those here in Des Moines. So that's doing exactly what it says. It's trying to prevent or reduce your chance of developing a cancer. Um, we also have treatment treatment trials here. So the treatment trials are trying to look for the next, you know, if they can improve on the standard of care treatment, looking for something that's more effective. We also do quality of life supportive or control studies. Um, so those are looking at ways to combat side effects. So they're dealing with side effects. Sometimes those don't seem as attractive to physicians up front. Um, but if you have, if you are having such horrible nausea and vomiting that you can't get through your treatment, you can't get your chemotherapy. Well, that's where these, these trials are really important. If we can control the side effects, so you can get 100% of the dose of chemotherapy you need, then that's going to impact your cure rates. Uh, we also have CCDR trials. These are somewhat newer. Um, so these trials are seeking to improve clinical outcomes and patient well-being by intervening on patient, clinician, and organizational factors that influence care delivery. So those can be a number of different things. Some of them are, are financial studies. Um, we're taking a look at if can people even afford their um, oncology um, treatments, and if they if they can't, how is that impacting outcomes? Next slide. So phase one trials are not something that we do here locally, but I think are done several places, definitely uh, University of Iowa. So with a phase one trial, you're truly looking at safety at that point. So a small number of people are participating. So 15 to 30 people go on a phase one trial. That is nationally how many would participate. Um, and your purpose is to find the safe dosage and then kind of observe how the agent affects the body. So you're increasing that dose a little bit of a time and then watching them closely. Next slide. Phase two studies, um, we do do these here locally, um, looking a little closer to how well the treatment actually works. So usually less than 100 people, and again, that's nationally, and you're determining if the agent has an effect on a particular cancer and how it affects the human body. So generally speaking, phase two participants have been treated previously, but the treatment wasn't effective. So these can still be some of your, um, you know, they don't have that many other options uh, at this point. Next slide. 
Now, phase three is kind of the bread and butter of what we do here in Des Moines. Phase three is trials are really comparing a new treatment to the standard treatment. So I'm going to finally get to talk about that placebo that I've talked about. I, so when people in a support group say, um, you know, when I ask, what do you hear of when you think clinical trial? And they say, well, placebo, I don't want to, uh, I have cancer. I need treatment. Absolutely you do. And, and you're going to get treatment. So on a phase three trial, these are your largest trials, um, 100 to thousands of people go on a phase three trial and you're comparing um, a new agent to your standard, standard regimen. So you have a control group versus an investigational group. So let's say you have colon cancer and the, treat, the standard regimen for your stage and type of colon cancer is regimen A. Well, both the control group and the investigational group are guaranteed to get treatment A the investigational group is going to get a new drug in addition to that. So you automatically get the treatment that's known to cure your cancer, and then we're adding a new drug on top of it. So then I have people say, well, obviously, like definitely I, I would do that. I would, I would wanna go on that trial. I'm guaranteed to get what's already known to work and I may get the next best thing. And so the advice I give people is, you know, with any new drug comes the potential for new side effects. So it's really still a conversation you wanna have with your, your treating physician, with your family and weighing those risks and benefits for yourself. Next slide. Phase four studies are again, not something we do here in Des Moines or, or at IORA, um, but still important. So this is hundreds of thousands that participate and you're kind of looking at the long-term safety and effectiveness of a new treatment. These, you don't see these as often. And the main reason is because um, treatment is already after a phase three trial, if it's positive, that that's when the drug comes on the market and has FDA approval. So there's just not as much um, attention to these trials because the drug is already on the market. Next slide. So every single clinical trial has a protocol um, and they're large and they're intimidating, um, but they serve a purpose. So the protocol really clearly states the reason they're gonna do this study, who can join, how many people they're hoping to enroll, um, what the treatment's gonna be, what medical testing will need to be done and when and how the information will be gathered. Next slide. It definitely very, very specifically is going to um, detail who can participate in a clinical trial. Um, some very basic common um, eligibility criteria would be a certain type or stage of cancer. Um, having received a certain type of therapy in the past, or maybe they cannot have received any type of therapy, um, that can mean a lot of different things. So they're either um, newly diagnosed or they are um, someone who maybe, it, it can be as specific uh, as has to have failed two regimens previously. Um, you know, our, our eligibility criteria is large. It can be, you know, four, five, six pages and very complex. So that's why we have really, really great staff that make sure that patients are eligible before they enroll. Um, ages are important. You know, we've had trials that are looking at um, people 70 and above are able to participate. So that's also something you might see. Again, this is very basic um, criteria that I listed here. Next slide. So why do we have the strict criteria? I think, you know, everybody it can probably figure out um, you want accurate and meaningful study results. So you need to make sure you're comparing apples to apples, oranges to oranges, um, and also safety. I mean, we want to make sure that patients that go on a trial, again, when you start adding in drugs, um, you start adding in the potential for more side effects. So if, if a new drug causes issues with, say, wound healing and you're, um, you're a struggling diabetic, then that might not be a trial that you would want to go on. Next slide. Participant protection is obviously important. Um, informed consent, that is a big process and it's a big part of what research coordinators do. So they sit down and they truly, they, they not only is it a document, the informed consent is a document that they would read through and sign, but it's also a process. And it's really important for patients um, and their families to want to 
participate, to be willing participants, to feel fully informed on what they're signing up for. Um, there are also scientific review panels, institutional review boards, data and safety monitoring boards, and this is nationally. Uh, if you're doing a, you know, any kind of a clinical trial, you're going to have oversight on these panels and boards. Next slide. Okay, the last thing I want to teach you is kind of um, how to read an article and know it, you know, ascertain some information from it. So um, people often hear about the results of clinical trials from overly positive or overly negative media reports, and these can influence the way people think about clinical trials and unfortunately can help reinforce some common myths. I remember I watched Bull. I don't know if anybody else watches that. I think it's on CBS. And there was something that happened, this was maybe a season ago that involved a clinical trial. And it just really painted this ugly picture of clinical trials. And I was so mad about it. And, and this happens more often than not that I'll see something. It, it could be even in, I mean, it doesn't have to be a fictional show. It can be in the Des Moines register. And I'm still frustrated about, um, you know, the way things are worded and what people can take from this report. So I'm going to give you guys some tips on if you see something, how you can um, evaluate the article. So next slide. So number one, who wrote the article? I, I will Google an author if I see something. You know, with, with social media, there's a lot of information out there. And I, I like to read articles and I wanna feel knowledgeable. Um, so I will go ahead and Google the author and find out who, who wrote it. Um, what is the basis of the information in the article? So facts and figures should be evidence-based rather than anecdotal. I love when I talk to give anecdotal examples of things. Um, but I'm not writing an article. I'm, I'm just sharing some experiences. So make sure that you're differentiating between the two. Um, does the article say if the study involved people, animals, or cells in the laboratory? Because that is definitely, if it's at the, at the person level, should be different than if it's still in the laboratory. Next slide. Does it include information on the phase of study and the number of participants? If it says it's a phase three trial and only 30 people participated, you should start questioning that. So remember, if it's a phase three trial, you sh there should be hundreds of thousands of patients on this trial. Um, if the study includes a new agent, has it already been FDA approved? Or is that maybe what the article is announcing that it's going to be FDA approved? And what were the characteristics of the people who participated? Remember that not all results apply to all people. And this, any more um, clinical trials are very specific. So, um, you know, my mom, my mom's mom died of breast cancer. And so my mom for, you know, all of her life has been interested in always, you know, paying attention to what's happening in breast cancer. And she will bring me articles and she will say different things. And I will tell her how this does or does not apply to what she's trying to learn more about. So just making sure that, you know, what you're reading is applicable. Next slide. Does the article discuss the benefits and benefits and risks for those participating in a balanced way? And who funded the study? The sponsor might have a vested interest, and that's not always bad. Um, you know, you can want to, as a sponsor of a trial, make money and cure cancer at the same time. Um, just I think that those need to be equally important. Um, it, it shouldn't just be about the money. There should be there should be a true um, curative intent as well. Who conducted the study and were the study results peer reviewed? That's something you can look for or just release at a meeting um, or a press release. So next slide. Okay, so here's some great resources if you feel like, oh, okay, I definitely want to know more about this. Um, that, like the National Cancer Institute has a cancer.gov slash clinical trials. There's the National Institute of Health, which would kind of be the larger umbrella over NCI has clinicaltrials.gov. We have patients call us that um, were on the clinicaltrials.gov and they were searching for a clinical trial and they found that a trial was open here in Des Moines. Um, and that was through a search they did on their own. And then our actual um, website is listed there as well as our phone number, just in case you ever wanna chat more or have questions, wanted you to have those resources. Next slide. I think it has my email was the last thing I wanted you to have in case you think of something after this talk that you want to know more about. I would love to hear from you. And I think that's the end for me. So thanks for your time and attention. I know that was a lot of information quickly, but I feel like the important thing is to let you guys ask what you want to know more about. So that was really what we wanted to accomplish.
Thank you so much, Shannon, for that presentation. So um, before we move on to the actual panel, does anyone have any pressing questions that they would like to ask Shannon about her presentation before we move on? I think I just saw somebody raise their hand. You can un feel free to unmute yourself um, and ask your question. Uh, hi, Kevin. My name is Anad Kamath. Um, I'm a lab uh, manager. And more importantly, I'm the son of a woman who died of appendiceal cancer at the University of Iowa. And so I have some experience with uh, <clears throat> an individual navigating the diagnosis of cancer all the way through, you know, her ultimate demise. Um, a couple things. One is that even with the standard of care that was prescribed by the oncologist at Iowa, there was a large pushback by the insurance companies regarding the classification of a rare cancer that belonged um, along with colon cancer in terms of the medications that were available for usage. So forget the clinical trial part, even the introduction of an anti-angiogenic inhibitor like Avastin was considered to be you know, a value-added agent that the oncologist and my mother had to fight for in terms of inclusion for her therapy. Um, the two things that I would like to ask you, uh, simply because I used to live in Maryland um, close to NIH is, one, does proximity play a role in the access that you have to clinical trials? For example, if I lived in Bethesda, Maryland, then I had access to the NIH. Sorry about that. Our lights are on timers, so um, I get uh, timed out. <laughs> but the question I have is, if I lived in Maryland, would I have more access to some of these clinical trials as opposed to living in Iowa City? And the second thing I wanted to ask you is um, the compassionate use of drugs for people who are considered to be terminally ill or have no resources. Um, there are some medications I know, at least in terms of uh, cancer and cystic fibrosis that have been utilized um, for patients who have been de-blinded with clinical trials so that they had one last crack um, at the introduction of those agents. And I know that legislation was being passed by the US Congress regarding that specific issue over the last uh, three or four years. I don't know whether you guys pay much attention to that effort, but um, can you speak to those two things? I can definitely answer the first question. I The second question is a little out of my wheelhouse, um, but <laughs> it's possible that somebody on the call, um, I don't know if anybody else is on the call from the panel could take a stab at that, but as far as proximity, um, so yes, definitely Bethesda is like, that is National Institute of Health and that is where National Cancer Institute's located. But no, you do not, by by living closer to Bethesda would not give you greater access to a trial. Really, um, so in the United States, um, there are lots of fun, funded community sites. Um, what, what the Iowa Oncology Research Association is, a we are a community funded site from National Cancer Institute. So we can open anything that they can open there um, mm -hmm. can be done here in Des Moines and even at any of our outreach clinics from mm -hmm. a regulatory perspective. So no, it should, proximity to the NIH should not um, make it easier to go on a trial. We should be mm -hmm. able to open anything here. And that's really, that is the purpose of having community oncology programs like what we belong to so that we can get those trials that they are open, those sound scientific trials open um, everywhere that um, participates in clinical trials. Thank you. I can try to take a, 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 a crack at your second question, Anand, and thanks very much. And Shannon, it was a, a wonderful talk. Thanks so much for the in introduction with the uh, slides. Um, I'm Doug Lowe, and I'm a medical oncologist at the University of Iowa. And uh, I sympathize with you, you know, with your, with you and your, your experience with your mother. Um, it, with respect to, uh, med I, I would also second what Shannon said about clinical trial access. Certainly, there are there will be more clinical trials um, focused in a given geographic area, especially in more urban areas, you know, larger mm -hmm. cities where there are more um, you know, academic cancer centers that are participating in clinical trials. Um, we do have a, we try to keep a variety of trials open here at the University of Iowa and in Des Moines for our patients. And we, we readily are willing to help refer patients 
elsewhere across the country to multiple different institutions. Sometimes we can even help to arrange some, some funding for this to help help patients. That's rare, but some, some of the bigger centers like MD Anderson will sometimes actually help to help with some of the transportation costs for patients. Um, with respect to your second question, um, medications are available on a compassionate use basis. We do offer um, when needed, you know, when, when there's the opportunity. If we have a, if there's a drug that is pending FDA approval um, and, and there's clinical data out there that suggests it could be beneficial for a certain mm -hmm. patient population, then we do have expanded access programs that we can apply for to get approval for the patient. We have to apply for the, we have to um, um, apply to be a, become a site that is able to administer that medication. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's much, we have to go through that process much in the same way that we would open a regular clinical trial here um, and get it approved by our, our IRB. But it is a, a relatively rapid process to be able to proceed with. So if we have a patient we've identified who has a need, we're usually able to get that medication for them in a fairly quick amount of time mm -hmm. um, and, and get that you know, cost-free to the patient. And then there are many other times though, uh, I, I, you know, many other situations that are similar to your mother's case where a doctor may want to prescribe a medication that she or he mm -hmm. feels could be very beneficial to the patient. Right. Um, and it's not necessarily a, 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 a clear standard of care for that treatment, right. Right. but we have strong reason to think that it could be helpful for that patient. Right. Um, and that in which case a drug would be, would be considered off-label for that indication. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But usually, the, oftentimes, the, comp the manufacturers themselves, if the insurance company does decline the mm -hmm. uh, coverage for the medication, we're able to go to the manufacturers themselves and ask uh, for a patient assistance program. Mm -hmm. And commonly, we're able to get substantially reduced prices, you know, co-pays mm -hmm. for the patient mm -hmm. or uh, obtain a drug uh, uh, um, free of charge for the patient, free of co-pay for the patient. Well, thank you so much for helping me out with that mm -hmm. explanation. I appreciate it. So thank you. So unless anyone has any other questions, I think we'll move on to the quote unquote formal panel discussion where we can um, ask more questions. So before we start, um, I'll give all of our panel members an opportunity to introduce themselves. And Dr. Lowe, since you just um, answered that question, if you just wanna give a brief background about yourself and anything you'd like to share with the group. Sure, thanks very much. I'm excited yeah. to be part of the discussion today. Thank you so much for having me. Um, but as I said, I'm a medical oncologist and hematologist. I'm uh, appointed here at the University of Iowa. The main areas of cancer that I um, cover here for patients or that I practice uh, medicine with here are involved um, the area of head and neck cancer, um, endocrine cancers, which would include thyroid cancers and uh, uh, cancers of other hormone related gl glands, um, as well as uh, uh, skin cancers, and specifically those cancers that are not melanoma. So all the other cancers, skin cancers besides melanoma. Um, and I also work in our clinical trials office here. I'm the director for um, education and compliance within our clinical trials office program here on the data safety monitoring uh, chair. Um, so I, within uh, my role here, I have the opportunity to, to bring a lot of uh, exciting and hopefully beneficial clinical trials to our patient population. And I've worked closely with our colleagues, with my colleagues here to, to do the same uh, in all the areas of, of uh, medical oncology. And um, we, at the University of Iowa, I think like Shannon's done a really nice job of outlining, you know, for, for a lot of um, community oncology programs, which offer clinical trials, there's a big need for these, for, for phase three trials um, and some phase two trials. At the University of Iowa, because of the, uh, uh, of the special um, technologies that we have at the university and at other universities around the country, uh, the ability to do to run research type samples uh, uh, more, you know, more effectively, more quickly. Um, we have the infrastructure here in place that we can run the earlier phase trials, like phase one trials. And these trials can, can um, be of great importance for patients when they're out of standard of care options. Um, and when there may not be a good phase two or phase three study that's open for them. Uh, for, for if you look at our, our, the realm of immune therapy around the world right now, we haven't been able to really get to that to, to, to many trials that are phase three with new immune therapy combinations that could be more effective than some of the existing medications that we have, like Keytruda. We all hear a lot about Keytruda on as advertised, which is a, a wonderful drug, but it only works in a you know relatively small num small percentages of patients. And we'd like to certainly be able to expand, you know, make that um, uh, uh, make the 
um, effectiveness of our treatments better. So we offer these phase one programs to try to uh, bring new drugs uh, out of, out of uh, clinical development pipelines from, from companies to our patients. Great, thank you. So now we'll move on to Lori, Lori Petick. Do you wanna briefly introduce yourself? Hi, thank you, Sarah. I am Lori Pedic. I'm the Director of Cancer Services at St. Anthony Regional Cancer Center in Carroll, Iowa. Um, I've had the privilege to work closely with Shannon and um, her team bringing clinical trials to a rural setting. Um, we've had a physician that was very passionate about clinical trials, and it was really a team and collaborative approach to make this happen. Um, we, we serve as 17 counties and almost 100,000 individuals in our area. So we've got the opportunity to bring something to patients that are getting treated here with us. Great, thank you. And now we do have the pleasure and I think the unique opportunity to have a current uh, cancer clinical trials patient with us. Uh, so Don Drake, if you wanna go ahead and give a brief intro of yourself as well. Uh, certainly. I live in Wilton, Iowa, retired in 2007. Uh, my cancer first was operated on in 2000. And I've had, I think, eight operations since and many other things, and it just will not go away. And I'm just too stubborn to give in to it. And uh, I was spent quite a bit of time at Mayo in Rochester, and then I moved my doctor to uh, Iowa City. Dr. Lowe is, is my main doctor now. And, uh, I, and I know most of you are talking about it's your job, it's what you do, it's how you get things. But understand my perspective. It's life or death. If we can't control it, it'll take over the body, and that's the end of that. So people that are on these have a little bit different perspective and it, it's very much life and death. And uh, I am personally very thankful for Dr. Lowe for finding this. I've got eight doctors and nurses over me. Why anybody wouldn't want on one of these is beyond me. And uh, they're caring about me. They watch over you. You don't have to call the doctor. They they get a hold of you and they take care of everything. I am uh, very thankful. Uh, Praise God for the people that are taking care of me at this particular time, the University of Iowa. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Don. And I'm not sure if he's on. Dr. Reed, are you on the call? I don't believe so. As Dr. Lowe can probably attest to, uh, when you're an oncologist, your schedule is never... <laughs> <laughs> what you thought it might be. So I'm sure he's tied up in the clinic somewhere, but if he pops on, uh, we'll let him introduce yourself. So um, now we'd like to have a discussion. Um, anyone on the call, please either feel free to unmute yourself or type a question in the chat. And these wonderful panel members are here to answer absolutely anything that's on your mind. As I like to say, nothing is off limits. If you have a question, it's a good one. So I'm gonna open up the floor to our participants and ask away. Sure, while people are getting ready to, or starting to think about their questions, Rachel asked a really great question in the chat earlier that maybe we can start with. And it was, I don't have it right in front of me, but it was basically how, um, biomarker testing might be uh, changing the clinical trials landscape. And Rachel, definitely unmute if I didn't get your question right. And I'll scroll back to to see if we have that. Uh, one comment I'd like to make if I can. Um, as you went through all the slides, it talked about the placebos, the non drug what I call non-drugs, and the fact that you don't use them in that, that was very, very helpful for me to realize that no matter what I'm getting, I'm getting drugs that will help cure my cancer. Because if you get a placebo, which is sugar pill, I'm sorry, folks, you're not gonna get any help out of that. So I was very happy to see that there are no placebos in this trial. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I think Don, you, you bring up a great point. Uh, and I, and it, it is, it's a concern for us too, as physicians, when we're offering clinical trials to patients, you know, what are the potential treatments that they can have? So placebos do play a really important role. They can help us better understand if a, an experimental treatment that we're looking to investigate, is it truly more effective than, than nothing? And, you know, there's a point, there's a, the time for that is there, there are, there are different time points in cancer and in a, in, a, in a course of one's cancer where perhaps there's actually no treatment available. I think one example I can give you is for, um, for skin cancer, for run-of-the-mill squamous cell cancer of the skin. There are it, usually it's something that's cured, but just by a simple small surgery or a little cryotherapy, freezing something off the skin. But sometimes some patients can actually have this cancer grow in a way that's pretty bad uh, and pretty advanced, and they need to have a big surgery and, and then um, we sometimes give radiation afterwards. Well, at that point, those patients are still at a high chance of having it come back. And we don't know of any other treatment that can prevent that. With the new immune therapy, new types of immune therapy that are out there now, we're wanting as a nation to explore, if we give immune therapy to these patients, does it help to prevent the cancer from coming back? And so we have a big phase three clinical trial open up nationwide right now where half the patients, where the patients are randomized after surgery and radiation, half of them get the immune therapy and half get placebo. And this is the, the best way that we're gonna know how well does the addition of immune therapy, how, does it, how well does it prevent the cancer from coming back in these patients who otherwise would have no treatment. So here the randomization is to placebo because with the placebo, we're, we, don't want, we don't want to let ourselves know who's getting the drug or, or the patients. And there are reasons for this, for blinding this. It makes the data more solid. Uh, it, it, it introduces less bias on the part of the investigators when we're reviewing the results of the, uh, interpreting the results of the study. So just to point out, placebos do have their role in this. this goes with, like with what Shannon was saying too, that certainly the, the word placebo can be scary when we're counseling our patients about trials and they might actually discourage somebody from participating. But I think it, it helps if we explain the rationale for it um, and, and um, you know, answer questions that patients may have when they're considering such a trial. Does anyone else have any questions? Otherwise, um, in our uh, pre-registration survey, we had a lot of questions around increasing knowledge and access to trials for people who are either in rural areas or low socioeconomic status or like health inequity populations. So panel members, what are your thoughts on that and kind of broadening access to other individuals? I can speak to the rural aspect as that is the population that we serve. And, you know, for us as a cancer center, it was finding a team of professionals that were passionate about bringing the clinical trials to our center, but also knowing the right people and um, having that understanding as a leader that there are resources out there. Shannon is my resource. We'll walk you through the steps to bring those trials um, to the, the patients that you serve. And I think that was probably one of the daunting ta tasks of why we didn't go down that road sooner is first and foremost, you have to have the leadership on board, the clinical team on board, and then somebody to go through the paperwork to make it happen. And it was not an overnight process for us. I think Shannon, I think it probably took us about six months from the real in-depth conversations to actually crossing our T's and dotting our I's. And once that happened, then the vetting process could happen with our patients. And it took almost five months to get a patient who would meet a clinical trial in our area. Though it does take time, those opportunities are there if, if individuals were willing to, to take those next steps. Does anyone else have anything they'd like to add? Otherwise, Lindsay, it looked like you may have had a question. Oh, Lindsay, we don't hear you for some reason. If you want to type it in the chat, I can go ahead and read it to our panel members. Perfect. 
while she's typing, I'll also uh, note is about um, access and location. So if somebody really wants to be in a clinical trial in our, in our past setting, they would have to drive two hours to get to a clinical trial. And that um, opening those up here locally really took away that transportation barrier and gave patients those options. Um, and for many of our patients being in an elderly population, they would need help with that transportation. And if they can get to their care themselves, they're not um, putting that burden or putting that um, onus on their family members um, and still not uh, denying some, some advancements in care too. Okay, and while we're waiting for Lindsay's question, it looks like we have another question in the chat. Do you foresee a day when a patient is automatically enrolled in a database by type of cancer when diagnosed and thus eligible for a specific clinical trial? I can speak, I guess, with respect to, you know, larger university settings, like here at the University of Iowa, we, we do have, um, uh, we have not only our patient chart, electronic patient health record, which is called EPIC, it's one of the more common ones that's used around the country, but there are um, software systems that can be put into place that can actually look across the patient population that we're seeing in our clinics, uh, for instance, here at the University of Iowa, and can identify patients who might qualify for, for um, a, a particular clinical trial. And uh, we've had a case here re re within the last few months, I can recall, where we had a trial opportunity uh, come available for a group of patients um, with a very specific uh, uh, gene mutation in their cancer across multiple tumor types. And we wanted to look back. We, we knew that we could probably, if we, we could look in our database, we might be able to find many patients across you know, all the the spectrum of cancer and, and maybe across several years history here who may have already had testing done that found a gene mutation. And so we were able to utilize that then to, to look and, and find several, several uh, patients who may potentially be eligible for the trial to be able to offer to them. Great. That's a great question. Okay, so Lindsay has typed her question into the chat, so I'll go ahead and read it. Uh, she says, I have stage four colon cancer with METS to the liver. I have been going to Mayo Clinic uh, for checkups and have discussed possible clinical trials. One that I have been particularly interested in is a trial they are starting where chemo is injected directly into the hepatic artery. Does anyone know if anything like this is available in Iowa? Question two uh, is if I was interested in looking into trials at U of I or in Carroll, I live in Northwest Iowa, who would I contact to discuss options? Thank you so much, Lindsay, for the questions. Yeah, as far as this kind of a, of, of a trial option, this, is, this would be something that would take you know, special expertise to be able to administer, obviously. Uh, usually an interventional uh, radiologist would be um, uh, given the task of, of giving this medication. So it'd be, this kind of a trial would be uh, restricted pretty much to larger academic centers where they have that kind of focused expertise. I would have to, I think it would it'd be helpful to know more what type of, you know, specifically what the, the, the cancer question is here. And then I could look to find if we would have something available. Um, we, do, we do have specialists here who administer chemotherapy through the, um, uh, uh, through the hepatic artery right now. And there are different chemotherapy combinations that can be used. And there are also actually even um, radiation type of therapies that can be given, del delivered locally like this using a, a, a mixture of really, really tiny glass beads that have radioactivity attached to them that can be helpful for cancer that's in the liver too. So I think it really depends on the cancer in question here as to, as to how we could best answer that here from the perspective of the University of Iowa to see if we have a trial, trial available. Great. I'd be happy to, I, I could provide or I can make sure that we um, get you, um, Lindsay, the a phone number for contact here for, for such a trial too. Sure, excellent. Okay, and then it looks like we had another question. Does bioinformatics play a role in leveling the playing field for those in rural environments or those with less access to NCI designated hospitals? Well, that's, that's a great question. I would love anybody else's opinion here on the group. I'd love to know what your thoughts are. 
I'm not directly involved in this issue, but we, I'm, I'm aware of it. And we've had ongoing discussions, I think with the Iowa Cancer Consortium and the University of Iowa and other partners, you know, other stakeholders in the state um, to try and figure out how we could improve access of clinical trials uh, to, um, you know, to rural, to our rural uh, um, citizens uh, throughout Iowa and as well as uh, underserved populations. This is a, a key thrust of, of um, effort within the state, you know, with all of our, uh, our um, cancer providers. And it's part of our, we see it as part of our mission here at the University of Iowa to, to be able to offer these kinds of opportunities to, to people in these populations. Um, are we using bioinformatics? What we are using right now is we're look, what we've done in the last couple of years we had, um, is uh, look back in our, in our trials database to see which patients we, are, we have actually served um, to make sure, look, look at the percentage of patients of different minorities and, and different percentage of patients who live in rural environments versus urban environments versus uh, suburban environments and try to look at them, um, you know, relatively, are, are, we, are we meeting the needs of these patient populations? Are, are we treating, are we offering trials to the patients in those populations at the same rate as we are to, you know, more uh, standard populations who live in, in, in our towns and cities? Uh, that's, that's a very good question. That's something that we're, you know, we're trying to address. I don't know if any of our panelists have anything to add to that part of the discussion, but that's a great question. It really just takes, I feel like it really just takes dedicated admi hospital administration at your, um, you know, your out, your outreach clinics, your um, more rural um, hospitals. I'm from a small town in Southwest Iowa, but I know that the medical oncologists that um, are members of our group, they serve that county hospital. Um, and so if, if the administration at that hospital was willing to put in the time and effort that Lori did in Carroll, Iowa, then we can absolutely, um, you know, there, there are, there is some red tape involved, but it's, if they're willing to put in the time, we can definitely get them added as a site. Um, and, and that's really how it should be. You know, I, I have talked before to rural, rural administrations and said, you know, when I grew up, I had, in Southwest Iowa, I had to drive 35 miles to the nearest Walmart to buy a pair of jeans. Um, my goal is that you can go on a clinical trial quicker than you can go get a pair of jeans because that's really the way it should be. We should have, um, if you're wanting meaningful data, we really need to be involving patients that live everywhere in the state, everywhere in the nation. Great. I think as a center director, it's really understanding what is our greatest population that we serve. You know, what are our top five diagnoses? Um, breast, colorectal, skin, lung cancer. That is what we see here locally in, in our highest population. So by partnering with Shannon is, are there trials available to meet the vast majority of our patients and give those patients those opportunities? Obviously, there's always going to be those nuances from stage and um, different uh background issues that would qualify somebody or not qualify somebody, but do we have access to the trials that are going to greatest impact our greatest numbers? And that's really understanding what our patient population is and the, the help of the registry in collecting that data, because knowledge is power. If you don't have the information, you don't know how to best help those around you. Great. So I think we have time for one more question. So does anybody have any last burning thoughts that they'd like to ask our panel members? I saw a question from Rachel at some point. I'm just going to read it here. Okay. It says, this may be crazy Iowa nice question, but do patients and families ever receive a thank you from either their cancer center, physician, or pharma company for their time and work to advance the science? So I'm gonna answer this in a couple different ways. And then if Dr. Lowe wants to add anything, he certainly can, or, or if maybe Don's received something or heard something. Um, so I know that, so, you know, I said we have offices in Ames. I know McFarland Clinic always sends a letter when a, right up front. So when a patient goes on a trial, they send a letter thanking them for their contributions to science for that. Um, I also know here personally, I hear our physicians thank the patients. And I hear our research staff continuing, you know, they go to every appointment and our, our 
um, you know, sometimes patients can forget that they're on a clinical trial. So our staff likes to be present for their appointment so they can remind them and that helps with compliance too. So thanking them for their time, thanking them for their willingness and just, you know, also serving as that reminder that they're on a trial, even if they're a couple years out um, from treatment, you know, we're still collecting data on them that's important. Um, and then um, lastly, I think that um, it, it, it's not, it, it's not Iowa. And I, I mean, I really feel like we should be saying thank you because we can't advance cancer without, I, I would like to think that everywhere um, has some kind of a thank you system where you're, if it's, if it's a letter, if it's just speaking with the patients and, and saying, Hey, thanks, this is important. And I, thanks for your, you know, being willing in your contributions oh, to science. I, I agree, Shannon and, uh, and Rachel, very good, important question. And we should be very thankful to, to our patients and their family members for, for being able, willing to help us try to learn together, you know, how to better serve our patients and, and improve the treatments that we're giving to, to patients. Um, I certainly, I think as, as physicians, we do try always to, to thank our patients and let them know that this is a very meaningful endeavor. And I know our clinical trial coordinators, like Shannon has mentioned also, you know, our clinical trial staff try to do the same uh, with our patients. Whenever we counsel patients about the option of a clinical trial, I want to be sure to tell them that, you know, by participating in the clinical trial, there's no way of knowing if a patient's going to derive any benefit at all. It's more important that, that a patient understands that by participating in the clinical trial, what they're really doing is giving a gift to those people who will come after them, the patients who will follow. Um, by learning from the outcomes of their care, we're going to learn how to better improve care for, for, for patients in the future. And uh, so I think it's important that they, that they understand that and also realize that this is, really is, it's a gift. And, and we're very grateful for, for their um, willingness to participate in these trials. Well, I think that's a wonderful note to end on. Um, so uh, we're out of time. The time always goes so fast at these events, but I wanna first thank our panel members for being present. Um, it, it was a wonderful interactive discussion and um, it wouldn't have been the same without any of you. So thank you so much for taking time out of your very busy schedules to be with us today. Um, as Kelly put in the chat, if anyone on the call has thought of any questions or you, know, you think of anything afterwards, please email um, the email she's put and we can reach out to these uh, panel members and maybe uh, get some answers for you as well. So the last thing, um, I've put a survey in the chat and we will also email this out to everyone who's on the call. We would love to just capture your thoughts on what you thought of today, what we did well, what we could do better, because I think these events will really um, help change the clinical trials landscape. You know, getting people together, talking, learning, interacting. And so if you could just take a few minutes to let us know what you thought about today, what you'd like to see in the future, uh, we would really appreciate your honest and candid feedback. Um, so that officially ends the roundtable today. Unless anyone has any closing thoughts, I would like to thank all of you, panel members, participants, um, other staff members. Thank you so much for being part of today and we wish you the best. Thank you everyone.